This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Well, that's a shame. The remote mic, something's happened, it's not charging. So, that's going to limit my opportunities to wander about, sorry. Well, I hope you all enjoyed Peter McGowan's presentation um, and the, the build-up I gave the week before, or the, you know, the lecture before, was worth it. So many, you know, just... I reckon that Peter could give a whole lecture on advanced, you know, material selection with all the associated issues when you take a material that otherwise we think is, you know, satisfactory, if not the preferred option, and put it into a hostile environment to which most of us would be unfamiliar. And the stainless steel one in an acid, you know, boiling acid environment was to me just a cracker. You know, that boiling effect was just continually removing the oxide layer that otherwise, in normal atmospheric pressure environments, just you know, sits along and floats along very nicely. For those of you who bothered to come, um, hint, that's the sort of, you know, whenever I think, wow, that's an interesting little nugget of information, and all these, you know, Peter's lecture, John Weir to come, Philip Chen to come, all those lectures are examinable. And I, you know, often have a few little, you know, they're not meant to be big mark questions in the exam, just, you know, things that I think are important that maybe I think you should think are important too. So, um, hint. Less profound, but still important. Springs. I made a start last time. And I have got a nice little glad bag full of bits and bobs. <coughs> Up on the right hand screen, hopefully. If I can get the light working. Oh, well, we'll use this one. Works. Just the idea of a spring, just I'm doing this so everyone can see. Coil spring, you know, common as Mark, hopefully everyone is familiar with this kind of spring. But that same kind of helical coil spring for this device, you know, an exercise tool for <coughs> grip strength, is being used as a helical toil, sorry, helical coil spring in that form. Same essential process works for something as simple as this. Just a clothes peg. And for students who didn't do um, mechanical design with me, this is just a simple example of a very elegant solution. There are only two distinct components to achieve this, you know, the functional outcome of, you know, securing 
bit of wet clothing onto a clothesline um, string. Um, two pieces of wood are the, you know, the same specification, the same engineering drawing, and the... Don't think I don't break it next time. This little component, helical spring, axle, support, structural support for the entire um, assembly. So whoever came up with that idea, that before and after scenario, very clever indeed. And here's one more of the same ilk. Now, I'll give a hint. People who go to gymnasiums will know what this is. Would anyone else, would anyone like to tell me what you think it is, what it's for? It is a, you know, it is a helical torsion spring, but what do you think it's for? What's its purpose? Yeah, whoever, could you say it so I can see it? Where are you? Oh, thank you, yep. This is, the, sorry, I'm just doing this. Two things at once. The student said, uh, barbell clamp or barbell you know, fixer. I don't have a, rep a barbell, but just imagine that this spring is a barbell with about the same diameter as the inside diameter of this spring. The cleverness of this device is that it, when it's at its unactuated size, that diameter fits in a, let's call it an interference fit over the barbell diameter. When you squeeze it, the diameter increases and you can take it off the barbell, or the, yeah, the bar. So when it's on the bar, then all the weights that, you know, you know 20, 20 kilograms, 40 kilograms, 80 kilograms, you don't want them falling off accidentally. This bit of, this spring provides enough frictional resistance to motion to enable the weights to be lifted and played with safely. So, it, and so, why is that interesting? It's making use of the spring effect, you know, the, this elastic uh, potential of the spring, but it's also making use of the function of increasing diameter, or increasing you know, the external and internal diameter of that spring increases with actuation. So, again, a very creative use or application of springs. And I've got another one. <coughs> this is a different design of spring. It's called a volute spring. I have plenty of toys for this particular lecture. Now, this kind of gardener's clippers or trimmers have that kind of spring associated with them. As distinct from this more conventional design. Now, this design works. Some of you in the room might be thinking, oh, it'd be, you know, that spring's got a bit of an arc going on. That could be put it at risk of you know, flying out in that direction by accident. Well, maybe. Um, you've got to have a pretty substantial end capture to ensure that the spring remains located where we want it to be located. But as you can all see, it does the job. This was, you know, I bought both these at Bunnings. This one, pretty cheap. This one, a bit more expensive. But the interesting thing about the bit more expensive one, I can quickly dig it out, is that they provided me with a set for some reason. So um, I don't know, you know, maybe you know, the spring is the component within this system, or this device, that's most likely to break first, or fall out first, or get dirt in it first so that it wears out, that they, they felt the need to provide a spare spring. Is that a good design or a bad design? I think if, that, if they have to put a spare in there, there's some, you know, my gut reaction is, oh, that means that the spring's not going to last as long as everything else. I, I have no answer to that, but it's just one of those kind of quality of design issues that you're going to get a lot more of from Philip Chen in a few weeks. So, I don't have, oh, I did actually have a little thing 
we talk about torsional spring. Just the idea of a bar twisting. You know, it will, if you know, it's made out of a really, uh, a material that has the uh, sort material properties, absolutely is. Very useful. <coughs> now, I do have a little case study on this. I'm just going to go one and then I'm back again, sorry. I don't know how many of you live in a home where there's these kind of draft excluders. Two pieces of extruded aluminium. They connect together in a nice little elegant way here so that we have a, a hinging effect. And this piece that I'm wearing, waving a laser over, it goes up and down and it's sprung to lift up when the door is not in its closed position. Against the, um, the architrave of the wall, there's a little, little button against which, against which this, will sur this surface will um, connect and push the, um, the flat down. The rubber strip sits against the floor, stops you know, ingress and egress of air, plus you know, dirt and dust and leaves and whatever coming in. So it's a nice little elegant solution, and this thing I put over the top of it, one end of a, just a rod of steel, pretty, you know, it's pretty spring steel, fits against the, um, the moving component, and the other end fits against the door. So we get that torsional spring effect that wants to, you know, when, when the door is not being at its closed position and the flap is being held down or pushed down, it'll flap up. Now, I can't, it's, the company's gone now, so I, can, I think I can readily talk about it. A company called Gainsborough. Had a, this will never be you doing something like this because I'm going to tell you about it. A graduate engineer from another university who I will not name, Swinburne, um, was asked to produce an alternative. And they were scared of, you know, they were scared of design infringement. So they asked this young man to come up with an alternative spring to that to achieve the same outcome. So, they, so Gainsborough could enter this market and you know, have a competing product. And what's up on the document camera, hopefully now, is, is you know, an example of the spring he came up with. I have a friend, Frank, who was a senior person in Gainsborough and asked me to review it. So long ago now that I, can, I think I can readily talk about it. So this side was to be mounted against the door side. This end was to be mounted on the moving part, and the idea was that you know the spring would do this kind of thing and push the, the flap up. You know, it's down against the door and push the flap up. Now, I'll ask all of you, what's wrong with that design? Any thoughts? I won't dwell on it for too long. The problem is the unit, the per unit strain. You know, we have you know, 45 or more degrees, oh, 45 or more degrees worth of motion required by the object. This is not a force limited problem, it's a deflection limited problem. I'll just go with that much. You know, that's more than 45. Let's go to 60 degrees. We're expecting a 60 degree motion. Now, 60 degrees in the way I've just sketched, and this is going the other way, where we've got a fixed end of that piece of rod. Sorry, I got that wrong. Let's call it the move end. And that's the fixed end. With that piece of uh, rod, per millimetre length of rod and the amount of twist it has to undergo is very small to get to that equivalent 60 degree worth of motion. To get to the equivalent you know, 60 degree worth of motion, most of the work is being done by just a tiny little arc of spring steel. Now, the, of course, they worked out that it was low cycle fatigue. You know, five, ten cycles and it wouldn't work anymore. And it would also sort of lose its springiness, it start giving local yielding. The student thought, oh, he sort of had a bit of a clue about this per unit length strain. 
So what he started doing was playing around with the effective length of the spring by doing all these extra curves, thinking that might help. But, you know, it didn't. And so the whole thing was trash and games where just had to go with another design idea. This is just an example of the sort of mistake that can be made if you lose sight. Let's look at the, let's look at the physics, the reality of what the, the situ situation is. Deflection required. Force minimal. Strain associated with deflection means that we've got to have something long in some form or other to be able to achieve the outcome. And this was not going to, this was not going to achieve that outcome. You know, even if the ex student had had you know, something long and thin where each bit of coil was making some contribution towards it, a long, thin spring that was boinking like that, might have been better. Because each per unit length of steel rod along the length would have been well within yield. Every, every per unit length is doing an equivalent amount of work. So, there we go. Another little case study. And by the way, part of the reason I do this is that you can read about springs in Sheetwick, the Butler's and Nisbet book. These are the things that make, you know, hopefully justify you getting up in the morning and coming to this lecture. Okay, there are plenty of other kinds of springs. This one up on the screen, especially the bottom one, the cantilever, fair enough. As long as we've got a nice um, fixed end and we're going to be confident that we are getting uniform you know, a strain along the length such that we're not going to just crack that peak in that location there where it's highest stress, we're going to go okay. This one down the bottom is very interesting and it's a, you know, I'm going to be talking about spring constant for a little while. How much force you know, it takes to deflect the object. We've got a force deflection relationship. And it's, you know, for by and large, greater than one. But this little interesting spring has got a spring force uh, versus deflection ratio of zero, or it can even be negative, which is a very fascinating spring type. It's just put out there to remind you that we don't always have to. You get, you get the equation that, yep, okay, k equals f on t, or k equals delta f on delta t, and you know, potential energy is area out of the curve. It's all, you know, we get to that in a sec. And it's very easy to think that's how it all always works. This one, the negative spring, is an example of a, 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 the opposite, opposite world. Can we do it in another way? And someone is, and you can just look, I'm not going to spend any time on it more than that, but there's plenty of stuff on the web for those who are interested. And um, don't forget about reactions. And this kind of, I'll be talking about this one, and there's a nice little image in coming. But you've got your tension in a long coil spring. You're going to have your reaction in the middle, but you're also going to have to cope with the associated um, desire for the spring to just, as a whole, rotate because of the moment that's being created. And that kind of spring is just hidden in there. Yeah, as you can tell, often very low, you know, K, spring constant, very low, but these kinds of applications assist with the motion. You know, just keep the motion operating at a rate that the, you know, the, the clockmaker or watchmaker wants it to move at. Now, I talked about force um, deflection, or well, here is a force deflection curve for this type of spring, called a Belleville spring. It's essentially uh, a washer in a conical form. And they do have applications, which I'll get to in a sec. The issue with um, this kind of spring, and they can be stacked in all kinds of interesting ways, is that we have a very, very non-linear relationship between force and deflection. And right down the bottom corner, I've got you know, a simple straight line relationship that we tend to think about with springs. Here's an example. They, by the way, they do have a very high spring constant, and they're useful for things like uh, pressure release valves in high pressure systems. That is, the pressure in the system gets too high, the force, where I'm pointing the laser now, pushes, too, um, pushes hard enough on that piston, it'll overwhelm this stack of bell springs, 
and then there's a pressure release. And if you want less pressure or more pressure before we release the pressure in a safety sense, well, you add or remove from the stack. It's a lot easier than having one coil spring, spring metal, you know, are we, we can't add to it, or are we going to just try and cut a bit off, a couple of coils off? The answer is no. Plus, a system like this of distinct spring elements can have value. It's essentially a series of springs in uh, series. So, they, they're also used in these type of railway buffers on you know, rolling stock in railway situations. And you know, they can be modified into this kind of thing, a diaphragm spring. And then up there, I've, that one's up there, plastic moulded spring. And sometimes, or in the past, I have used this little, you know, hey everyone, there's a plastic moulded spring design. It's essentially working as curved beams. And the curved beam will distort because of the supports being 90 degrees away from each other. And I, I, I remember an exam I asked where I actually, what I've just answered, what I've just said, was the essential question being asked in an exam setting. So, again, it's good to come. Now, the nature of mechanical springs, I've given this, this is perhaps one of the simplest relationships you'll ever come across. This might be charged up by now. Excuse me. No. Yep, no, sorry. Part of why I did this is I, I like standing over there and I forgot that I'm not being recorded. So I better come back over here. So we've got the basic relationship. Force equals some spring constant times x for the bulk of springs you'll ever see. Linear relationship. Um, stored energy equals the area under the curve. Stored energy equals kx squared on 2. Triangle. Um, and the slope, k equals delta f on delta x. Or just any deflection on x on any f. Uh, under any f. Force f. So pretty simple stuff. But it gets really complex. We'll get onto that. The maths gets a bit more fun. Two springs in series. Two string springs in parallel. When in series, gets a bit harder. When in parallel. And that relationship relies on the two sides or the two walls against which the springs are pushing being um, infinitely stiff. If they start to wobble in any way, that simple equation starts breaking down. So in series, the springs share the force. In parallel, the springs share the deflection. So whatever the total number, whatever the springs, however far the spring assembly deflects, one spring's taken up a bit of it, another spring's taken up another bit of it. Now, up on the screen now is an example of, it was a Master of Philosophy program. Again, another... Uh, little aside. Now, this was a, a master's program done by a guy called Barnaby Hume with my PhD supervisor, Andrew Samuel, and me. And up on the screen on the left, yeah, you've seen, I've waved around that condyle. It's, a, it's just a plasticised thing. It's not a real human bone. It's, these are two bones from a human knee, you know, representing a human knee, and the person has lost their anterior cruciate ligament, one of those AFL football type uh, injuries that people endure. And when you're an old person, you can't harvest. It's a lot harder to actually get a replacement. And some orthopedic surgeons asked, can we put a you know, non-biological um, component inside? And, um, well, Barnaby's work involved a sheave and essentially um, bungee cord as a material, and how do we fix that bungee cord at the ends? I'll show you these little, um, the very interesting little screw that we came up with. We have that model over there is sort of playing around with where the surgeon would have to drill the hole to be able to insert the, um, the replacement ACL. And over here on the left, is a ex vivo or out of the body 
you know, low deflection curve for ligaments and um, uh, anterior cruciate ligament uh, material. And you might see it's very, very nonlinear. So we played around with the idea of having two springs in series. One spring would be, you know, stiff and would do most of the, uh, at the low, sorry, one, one spring would be, sorry, flexible, floppy. And we'd, oops, sorry, and we'd get that low spring constant dominating. Then when we got it to its end point, it was no, would no longer deflect anymore, then a stiffer spring would take over the load. The floppy spring was going to be mounted inside these um, end screws, and then the bungee cord would be the connecting, let's call it the connecting rod, and we'd have an anti-abrasion uh, sheet because you don't want you know, our non-biological material rubbing up against bone. That was a, a big mistake in a previous design. And this is a titanium screw that we came up with. You might, you know, why I'm showing you this is to, to just indicate, it's very easy just to think, okay, what kind of thread will we use? What kind of thread is appropriate? And um, for, um, you know, in our world of engineering, there's a whole heap of different thread designations. But in the biological world, we needed something else. We needed something that was um, titanium, was chosen because bone, for some reason, and I've not been given an answer yet as to why, bone loves titanium. It'll attach itself to titanium, grow against it. So we're, we needed, we wanted these kinds of flat surfaces to allow for a series of locations where the bone would support the screw, which would support the ACL. And then we had and it had to have an internal hole big enough to allow for the assembly I was talking about. We also had to have, and that's not incorporated in this prototype, some means of allowing the orthopedic surgeon to screw that component in. So, for those of you who are thinking, what am I going to do when I graduate? Let's just say you've got a little bit of a biological kind of bent, and you're not doing biomedical engineering. Just something to think about. You can still be mechanical engineer and be doing work that actually benefits you know, people in this intimate way. And Barnaby, Andrew and I, we, whenever we had a bio type problem, a medical type problem, we just asked the surgeons. So that was how the team was able to function. And that's part of the reason why I bang on about teams so much. It's very important once you've got a directed goal, then it's just a case of working out how to communicate towards that directed goal. And, and that's all you've got to do. And then it's just personalities, work through that, and um, we can get to outcomes. Now, this um, has not gone to market for lots of reasons, one of which is a previous product um, upset the various bodies so much that um, they, they sort of were very against the idea of any new product going into a body of this type, and it cost a huge amount of money. To, to actually even get it through the review. So, back to sort of more hard engineering stuff. On the right, a cutaway of a, an engine, just for people who never, don't think about engines very much. Um, crankshaft, conrod, piston, piston housing, some valves for inlet, inlet of you know, air and fuel, outlet of burnt fuel. Now, in high uh, performance vehicles, they often had this idea of a dual spring, one spring inside another spring. And I'm not going to read all that stuff out. A guy called Harry Watson, if you ever, um, if you choose to go on to do Formula SAE or Melbourne for MUR team stuff, you'll hear about Harry a lot and you'll hopefully meet him. He was a thermo professor here in this department and he, I asked him about this stuff from a, you know, because he's into motor racing as well. And I said, just, Harry, why do they do that? What's the benefit? And the words up there are, are thanks to Harry. But just in case you're wondering about um, why I brought this up, because there's some nice videos online to show the limits of speed associated with these things. I might as well give you the sound. Now, this is a super slow mo, which is nice.
Now, you can see the two springs, and can you see, that, yeah, this is going you know, super fast, and you can see these second, these harmonics. The spring is actually wobbling, as is the inner spring. Now, these, this can wobble so much, look, can wobble so much that we can, it can move off the end, which is bad. We don't want those kind of impacts. Also, we don't want those coils coming into contact with each other. To come into contact with each other is very bad because it's going to upset the performance of the spring. It'll be not, it won't be doing as per what we designed it to do. The, the sound's not working, it doesn't matter. It's about the visual. Here's another one. And the whole point, why it's such a flickery thing, is that we've got a super high-speed camera slowing it all down to show what's going on. Another thing that's worth noting is the springs are processing. They're rotating. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? As far as I'm concerned, well, all we want that spring to do is to go up and down. We don't want it to be moving in that, around its own axis. So any energy that's going into that, I regard as being something that we'd rather not have. And same thing here. So as you can see, there's a lot of this stuff on the web. Now this one has got a beehive effect. I'll talk about that in a sec. It's essentially the outer, let's call it about the coils wrapping around in a helix form. They are not constant diameter um, circle. They're actually changing the diameter along their length. Yet another bit of fun associated with springs at a more advanced level. So, I've already talked about this in the lecture a couple of days ago. I preempted this particular one, but I thought I'd add it. Oh, that's the video. It's starting to work. Excuse me. <laughs> Good on you. But, but not today. Not today. Thank you. Sorry about that. The, the sound I wanted wasn't coming up, and that does come up. <laughs> so I talked a bit about it on the screen. I thought I'll put it up on the you know, rejig the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, what is the impact of the connecting ends of these springs? They are acting like two springs in series, and that when We've got these ends like that. They are, will have a lower spring constant than the main coil, and they have to um, achieve, you know, get to their end point. Get to a, they're not going to act like a spring anymore. They move to a point where they're not going to elongate, and then the other coil spring will start taking over. We've got issues as well, which I've written up there about stress concentrations. If we're going to go fatigue, if it's a, you know, load goes on, load goes off repeatedly type of arrangement. So, um, just something to think about as an engineer. Because after all, these zones are zones of discontinuity. Alrighty. <coughs> deflection, rate of deflection, elastic potential energy, and we tend, yeah, I'm going to be focusing on linear elastic by and large. There we go. The cliche of the spring that I waved in front of the document camera <coughs> a few minutes ago. And I'll wave it in front of you now. Just this part of the spring is all we're looking at right now. We've got a few features. This, at this moment, we've got a force being compressive. We've got an overall length. We've got a pitch between adjacent uh, wires, or wire, you know, that's a wire section. What else? And we've got the diameter of the wire. And we've got the number of loops number of coils within the spring. So this is where springs come from. There's an awful lot of variables that we, in theory, have available to us to play around with. And also the stress becomes fun. I've, I've now, instead of having the total spring, I've cut it back, and you know, free body diagram, we can slice an object anywhere, and as long as we, um, we are in static equilibrium for the whole device, any slice of that device will also be in static equilibrium. Force applied, reaction force is still going to be applied at that bit of coil, but 
there's going to be an associated moment, because after all, we're off the neutral axis, to be able to keep maintain equilibrium. It's not a moment, though. It's going to be a torque. It's going to be a twisting effect on any piece of wire. So, because there's two forces associated with that area where we've sliced, there'll be two stresses. Now, this is a simplification. There will always be end effects on these kinds of things. But given that the moment always dominates, hopefully you picked that up well by now, we just assume it to be linear across the uh, diameter of the wire section. The torsion, however, will be a, a TR and J or MY and I type of thing. We'll get to that in a minute. But that's going to vary. Maximum tension, maximum tension, maximum compression, because it's a pure twisting type action. And this is the joy of stress, like the joy of force. If it's all going in the same direction, we can just add, we can super, um, super position them. And at one end, we're going to have a decrease when we add. And the other end of the wire, we're going to have an increase. I can, just from the image, hopefully everyone can see that we get an increase in stress at the inside surface. So that's where maximum stress is, is happening. We could presume that that's where we're most likely going to fail if we are a coil spring, a la what's on the screen. Maximum shift, minimum at the inside surface, that's where we're most likely to fail. So tor equals TR on J, stress equals the shear normal equals force on area. I've given all of the equations there. We've got a couple of nice equations, you know, pump in the numbers, get some results. Do the superposition and we get to this. And the plus or minus is just for the inside versus outside surfaces. Now, but it gets more complex, as it always does. Up on the screen now, when the you know, we've got this upwards shear stress that I've played around with here um, in the inside surface, that's our overall maximum shear stress. And various books, and especially the book I prefer most of all is by Wahl. Uh, Valve, perhaps is better. Mechanical Springs, it's an old book, 1963. Yeah, but if you want to get a book, the Butler's and Elizabeth Shimley book is as good as any. C is the coiling ratio, and it's, this is what engineers love to do. Cut down on the number of variables if there's a strong relationship between them. You know, a bigger, larger overall diameter of springs, most, more than likely it's going to be a larger diameter of wire. So, you know, that C is a reasonable thing to play with as a single constant. And this K shear for a factor is just, you know, again, combining some stuff. Now, we can um, model static deflections with Castigliano. Have you all heard of Castigliano somewhere? It's a, it's a very powerful uh, tool for getting a relationship between forces and deflection, or flip it, deflection and forces, with respect to energy, which is very nice indeed. If you haven't, you will. And um, in the context of this lecture, I've got the world's example coming up. We've got our coil spring again, forces equals zero, nothing's happening. We've got our L naught equals our initial length. We'll eventually apply a actual force. And this is what we have to do. With those two, um, you know, the two stresses that I was able to develop, and the forces associated with those stresses we're able to develop, we're able to find out what the overall um, energy associated with those stresses are, and those deflections are. We can substitute T equals FD on 2, which is what you know, torque associated with force, associated with diameter of the spring, and the overall length equals a certain something, polymer of area, uh, area of section of the wire, and that's polymer under the area of the wire, we get a new value for the overall potential energy of a spring, coil spring, as we're going to start applying a, a force to it of a certain amount, with all the other things in place, by the way, G, torsional stiffness akin to E, which is Young's modulus or linear stiffness. And some books use NA. 
active number of coils. And I can even, there's another little nuance that I can give you a hint on. I'll get rid of all my, my other toys. This little spring. We could say that we start from there and end there, count, count the you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but that's not really true because a whole heap of this starting zone is just so the, the spring will you know, sit like that without falling over. So we've got to find out really, in, I could assert that we start from where my nail is now. This bit of spring is like those interesting end effects that are not necessarily participating as everything else is participating. So we're going one, two, three, four, five, six, and we're not, you know, we get to here and we, it's okay, because then the rest of that is also an end. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven coils. N A equals seven. Certainly not one from there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That would be a, a big mistake. So, not eight, but seven for that example, for the active number of coils. So from unloaded, apply a force, we compress a bit, we're at L minus X in total height, and we can start playing around. In this case, I've got X being in the uh, vertical direction. X equals to UDF, and we play around with it. C equals capital D on D, we can substitute that in, and we're, we're at an answer. It's as simple as the first, if you like, derivative of the equation back here of for U with respect to F. So F squared, derivative of that would be 2F. Back, sorry, I should have put both these on the same page. So 4f squared turns into 8f. So it's as simple as that. And everything else is constant. What is the active variable associated with the partial differential? Now down the bottom, we've just played around with the equation to see what it's approximately equal to. And that's again homework, something you could play around with yourself. And um, once we've got our approximate value for x, we can then get our spring rate force on x, and that's um, our forces cancel out, which is nice because that is on the bottom, on the denominator. The f cancels with that f on the numerator. Done. So it's a pretty quick process. Once you've gone to, through to get your value for potential energy, that pretty, you know, multivariable equation was the big thing to find. Now once you've got, you know, review that material and you will find, if you choose to, that springs like what's up on the screen now, a variable diameter coil spring can be readily solved for. It's just now we've got a relationship between x up and down and diameter. That's, that's all that's going on. It complicates things by no more than that. But we get a very interesting non-linear you know, force deflection relationship and a non-linear um, spring rate or constant K. So that sort of thing exists as well. And you can get to kooky, you know, interesting ones like that. So. I'm trying to show that the, the, the universe of springs is a bit like the universe of metals, of materials that you can select. There's a lot of them. Okay, now this idea of the beehive, I introduced it and there was a video that didn't show it as clearly as what you see here, but maybe now in retrospect, this idea of a changing outside capital D of the spring can be used and has been used in automotive applications for high speed um, piston uh, springs as an alternative to that nested double spring effect. And um, there are certain advantages. For example, when you've got a spring of that type, that, that pulsing, that second order effect, which is, I forgot, 
again, trying to be show. I don't know if anyone's ever played with a slinky, but you can see, even though I'm just doing this in front of you, I hope, I give it a little pulse, and there's a, you know, that pulse moves along the spring and back again quite readily. And that's okay, it's fun and games for this, but when you've got high speed automotive applications, you know, it becomes a serious, deleterious, or unwanted issue. Something to be dealt with. Okay. I talked about the worst case stress being at the inside surface. It's worse than that because of the idea of fatigue. Uh, when we've got a fatigue-based issue, and all I've been talking a lot about fatigue-based stuff, we actually get this effect in a curved bar. It is not, in reality, a linear system. Excuse me, these people are talking out here. So we have to make accommodations for a maximum stress that's actually greater than that linear equation would indicate. And um, <coughs> what else are we talking about there? This is what it looks like. And again, thanks to Valve, he's provided me with this image on the left. This is actually what it looks like. We don't have zero stress in the middle of the wire, it's to one side and we've got a maximum stress far greater than the linear equation would otherwise indicate. So we need another factor. And that's all that the engineer needs to do. It's called the Wahl factor. Thank you, Arthur, Arthur Wahl, for finding it. And Wahl factor corresponds to this, for a coil spring. And it includes both direct and torsional shear, which is nice. And this part is what's accounting for that curvature effect. And you can see now a bit more why that capital D on the little d corresponding to C has been introduced. It just cuts down on the clutter of variables. <coughs> so, this idea of local yielding due to a very high peak stress, they call it a local set in, in the trade. I've got an assertion here that stress concentration effect can be ignored for static load, but it must be considered for fatigue. Now, I'll, I'll, the question and the answer is both up there. Mechanical design fatigue's already been done. If you didn't do mechanical design, 30114, and you forgot your equivalent fatigue from somewhere else. If it's not fatigue based loading, load goes on, load goes off, load goes on. You can get a local yielding in this inner surface, in a steel or other highly ductile material, and it doesn't matter. You know, just think about how many objects you've ever seen that's you know, supposed to be straight but it's a bit bent. Made out of steel and it continues to work, it's all fine. It's got everything to do with the yield point being so far removed from the ultimate tensile point. So yield strength, tensile strength, there's a big elastoplastic zone. And just because a little bit of steel has yielded, doesn't mean that the bulk of the spring in this case, or the spring wire, is also going to yield. It can actually assist in the function of that object in static. In fatigue type loading, we little crack, we've got that yield point, it's no longer participating in the active spring-like um, resistance to a cyclic load, and we've got every, you know, every risk that the yielded zone will increase in size we will get to a point where the amount of material that is un, as, remains unyielded, or still a spring, <coughs> will be some too small and we break. Now for those people that are freaking out, thinking, oh god, I've forgotten fatigue, haven't done fatigue, I managed to sneak into this class, I do a more advanced treatment of fatigue in the next subject, design for integration. This is just a, a reminder. Because dynamic loading, we've got, you know, mechanical engineers, mechanism, movement, you know, we, we have to think about consequences of dynamic loading. That's why it's an important thing. <laughs> because we're dealing in the world of stress, and I've just introduced the world of fatigue into the world of stress, and in particular, um, torsional yielding, leading on to shear stress, this big slide is just communicating that endurance limits <coughs> in shear for materials is a lot harder to get our hands on than normal stresses.
And again, um, I found a reference. This is um, Zimarelli now. And again, it's old as can be, 34 and 57. More recent references might have different values, and that's okay. You know, this is, I'm, I'm giving you what, something that I've done. Part of it's the challenge for you to do what you want to do, even when you get into the Melbourne unit and you are. Let's say you want to be in Formula SE, and you're dealing with trying to optimise your engine for the racing car, and you've got to look at the springs. Don't just rely on this slide. Do your own investigation. You know, these things do evolve as long as there is an impetus or a reason to evolve and get better. But nonetheless, in my exam, for this subject, this is the sort of material that you use and you need to use no more. If you choose to use more, indicate that you've been in this lecture or reviewed this and you understand it, and then that plus what you've uh, chosen to introduce into your design assignments. Plus, please, always ask the mentors. The tutor mentors will mark, and it's important to get that feedback. That's why the sessions exist. Don't just leapfrog what I've talked about and do something else. It's sort of right, it's sort of wrong. Just do as I just said. Do what I do, do it my way, and then also do it your way. And I can guarantee, and ask the mentors, and I can guarantee you success. Here's a bit more about stress, and then I'll stop. It's about five two. Unmodified endurance strength in shear, unpeened versus peen. And there's a whole little blurb there about what peening is. Essentially very small particles, shock peening, bouncing at high speed against the surface of, it doesn't have to be a screen, it can be any object. And in that, in, through that process, it's essentially a work hardening of the surface. <coughs> Getting rid of little cracks on the surface, applying a little pre-compression to that surface, it stops the initiation and progression of, you know, let's say microscopic surface cracks here in springs but in any other object as well if we want. And you can see if you've got high performance such that the extra cost of this manufacturing process doesn't matter, well then do it. If it's common as mark like a children's toy or, you know, inconsequential if the spring breaks, like the shears with that spring I showed you where there's a spare, then you wouldn't have a bother. It's 5-2. Time to stop. Have a great weekend.